Hi folks, this is the AI first engineering, AI banking in the discussion. Remember we're talking about all these different industries that are getting revolutionized by AI. In this uh, little module, we discuss a bit about the system, ending up with banking as a service, which we'll discuss in module F in a little tiny more detail. All right, the overall system, whether there's a front, a middle and a back, like many such systems. The front office is the, co the consumer. The back office is the system. And in the middle, you have a lot of middleware doing nifty services, such as anti-fraud, anti-money laundering. We do credit underwriting and smart contracts here in the back office. Here we have AI biometrics, personalized insights, and conversational banking, chatbots and stuff like that. And here's the number, here's the amount of money that you're saved by using AI. Uh, it doesn't really, I understand that's always the only way to think about it, because AI is meant to do something totally new. And then you don't really save money, you just make a whole new opportunity. But it is anyway that this estimate says it's the back. The back is not so useful, fun, Fiscally, it's the front and the middle office both have around $200 billion um, to save. And here's a little discussion of the front office, and I've really been through those already. Chatbots, I say, you probably, I've said many times, I'm not a great fan of chatbots, but um, <coughs> they, uh, uh, probably better than the phone ringing forever and never being answered. And they obviously use NLP and uh, and um, well, NLP is machine learning. Machine learning implements NLP. And obviously able to recognize your voice, um, create their voice. And um, this says that 2022, just $8 billion. And that was only 20 million in 2017. So this is, it seems pretty simple chatbots, but they're still they're only just starting to make progress. Biometrics is clear, security is a real pain. Anything that can make that security more robust and easier is certainly a good idea. And my eyes and fingerprints or whatever you want to recognize or face, uh, I, prefer, I think it's, I'd rather, Remember those and trying to remember a complex password. Um, all right, here we have personalized insights. Well, that AI must be useful here because personalization is is clearly uh, very. That's a lot of recommender engines and things. It's very very successful in other areas, and this includes as investment decisions. See for a particular risk risk strategy and a particular. Um, investment amount, what the best investments are. Clearly, that is done, in, as they say, in a hodgepodge way here. Um, all right, next one. So here we have um, actually a surprisingly small application, robo-advisors. This is in the so-called wealth management area, which is basically investment advice and processing. And is that such a lot of AI and all sorts of things can be applied. Just ordinary digital, digital services connected with stocks and their performance and the trends and everything. It's a bit surprising that's not a larger fraction. Even if the um, robo advising is actually f has information fed in by some real skillful people, because at the moment it is um, they're 43 trillion dollars in assets in. Uh, in North America in 2018, and they're only um, 330 billion, which is um, around 1%, and they hope it might grow to 2%. Well, that's not so large as you might have expected. So I would say there's a huge opportunity here. Um, here is these numbers, uh, 330 million here, a billion rather. I, you know, another feature of banking that's so amazing is how big the numbers are. Huge. And here we have 830 billion. Remember, that is 2% of the total 
amount of sort of wealth, which is the stuff invested in real estate stocks and things like that. So this is um, totally untapped. We're only doing 2%. Because I think even this coronavirus has sort of expanded the um, clientele. I mean, we know these banks like Robinhood doing well. That's, I think, partly because they relate to the younger people who've actually had time off so they can actually do investing, which they didn't used to do, because they're stuck at home. Being a day trader is one of the more, probably more interesting things to do. So this is pretty, pretty promising. So thank you very much. Middle office. Well, we mentioned fraud. Fraud is a nice area. Well, it's a bad area, but it's a, a nice, elegant um, piece of research or study area. Because it's rather well defined. You're looking for unusual, um, you're looking for particular signals, which are often anomalies. Uh, like uh, me, it, when there's a lockdown in Indiana, buying a hippopotamus in China. That would probably flag the fraud detection software of the, of the bank. Um, <clears throat> So anyway, it's going from 22 billion to 48 billion by, by 2023. Then there's these nice words here called know, know your customer and anti-money laundering, where the banks are meant to be monitoring the misuse of money. And again, the AI, AI, you know, I've been rather rude about some of these fintechs because it's not so obvious they use AI. But it is true that AI is, allows you to do things much faster because you have no human in the loop. And some simple things can be done by AI, which would really can really speed up things, and including checking the transactions. This is a really more like fraud detection again, are valid and sensible. I, we already discussed in detail FinTech and neobanks. And they're a dominant trend in this middle, middle, middle. Actually, more in front of us, because remember the poor old neo banks often didn't have licenses. A payment gateway, and here is um, the the value chain for payments from the front end. It comes through a gateway. Then we have the back end merchant, the payment processor, and. Um, there are various players in this field, including Alipay and Amazon playing a major role, obviously. And uh, Alipay playing even a, I mean, we know Alibaba is a huge competitor of Amazon and it's secretly probably bigger, uh, but it's in China, so don't, people don't look at it quite so much. PayPal is a famous player in this field. And of course, they, they all come back to the Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover uh, credit card processing. And then we, of course, have to have the bank, which puts their name on things. And they remember I pointed out APIs are very important. If you want to build an interoperable system so all these things can interact with each other, you better have very well-defined standards so that the Visa interface is compatible with the Alipay technology and the Amazon technology and the Stripe technology and so on, and PayPal. And <coughs> here is the uh, chart on, uh, on actually the, the money to be made in payment gateways. Here's the revenue from fees, which is this thing going up to um, I assume $138 billion, <laughs> that's quite a large number. Here is the uh, processing volume roaring up there as to incredible a large amount of money. And um, here we have the year and here we have the percent, the how much the uh, payment people are charging, which is not a trivial amount. It carries going. This is very between 2.7 and 2.4 percent. That's a pretty healthy fraction. So that you know, sometimes people prefer cash. Well, one of the reasons they prefer cash is credit cards and all this automated system. They suck it to you. These you know, people like Visa and and maybe uh, pay. I mean, the other people in this space, they charge a lot of money.
in the final slide and this banking as a system is banking as a service, which is a way of thinking about banking systems, that you build it out of services and banking itself is a service. And um, here is this little chart that, um, plot about the number of APIs there. Uh, in 2017, 1,675 APIs. You know, banking doesn't sound very much. You, put, you um, hand some money to somebody and they stick it in some some machine and the machine sends it off to a bank. Well, that requires 1,675 APIs. Pretty interesting. Um, so if you look at this ecosystem and you have um, People who provide the ecosystem, the clients that use the ecosystem. Services always have APIs, because the whole point about services is they're event-based or message-based. Those events or messages must have APIs so they can glue into the system in a standard fashion. So an event from Amazon and an event from Alibaba can be viewed as the same event by the later processing. So here we have the fintech paying a fee to access a banking as a service system. It uses APIs to build new services. Remember, these are service means you're event-based or message-based. The services receive messages which says something happened, some fraud was about to happen. It, it sends it off to its own software, which is this AI to detect fraud. And then it sends a message back to the system saying, Disallow. Um, and the financial institution, here we have old Wells Fargo, or Goldman Sachs uh, being a little sleepy. They, they um, have their own system supporting these APIs, and uh, the FinTech can then access them. All right, that's the end of this section, section D on the system. It's not very difficult, is it? It has three parts. An API, 1,675 APIs. So.